this is the Public Affairs Forum, the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin, Texas. And we're located at 4700 Grover in North Central Austin. Today we're honored to have uh, two special guests uh, with us, and to introduce them, uh, we have Bonnie Gardner. Bonnie. Thank you, Luther. Well, today I'm very happy to be able to introduce two um, committed social activists who are advocating for gun violence prevention, Ed Scruggs and Susan Nelson. In the past um, decade, we've seen more and more deadly mass shootings and um, of innocent people in movie theaters, schools, church settings by people who either have some sort of political agenda or who are mentally ill and yet they've had no trouble or little trouble obtaining weapons. And uh, we know that access to weapons is a key factor in gun violence. And yet Congress has not acted on this issues in bec part because of powerful um, lobbies like the National Rifle Association uh, at the national, state, and local level. But there are some signs of forward movement um, Recently, in the U.S. Uh, Congress, we saw our con congressmen and representatives standing up for gun violence prevention with a historic filibuster and sit-in. And in Texas, for the first time in many years, you have a bipartisan group coming together to learn more about gun violence through the Texas Coalition to Reduce Gun Violence. Ed Scruggs will be providing an overview on the work of Gun Sense, which is a nonprofit educational organization. And Susan Nelson will be describing her own personal experience as a survivor of gun violence. Ed is on the volunteer board of Texas Gun Sense. He's also on the City of Austin Public Safety Commission. He led an effort to remove guns from the, or the established gun show from the Travis County Expo Center. And the, he is now working to educate businesses across the state on their legal rights to restrict open carry of handguns. And Susan is a very active volunteer with Gun Sense, and it's going to be great to hear her personal story. Let's give them a big welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for um, attending this morning. It is a beautiful, beautiful Sunday, and I know many of us wish we could be outside, so I know that this is um, a donation of your time and spirit uh, to be here with us today. But thank you so much because it makes such a huge difference um, that you all come out and spend this time. Uh, some of you may recall that um, I was here back in late February and March uh, for Texas Gun Sense with our executive director, Andrea Brower. And at that time, we gave a general presentation about the problem of gun violence in America and about the issues in the state and how they relate to the state legislature and new laws. At that time, we were dealing with the implementation of the open carry law and we were about to implement campus carry um, because we live in a state that <clears throat> continues to expand gun rights and access to guns. So that was a very interesting um, conversation. We actually, we had a Japanese news crew at that time doing a documentary on guns in Texas. And I have actually seen the finished product. And it was a very highly rated um, documentary in, in Japanese on a Japanese news network similar to our CNN. And uh, I've... I've heard that the audience couldn't really believe what they were seeing. Um, audience, um, people carrying guns into restaurants and wanting to carry guns in schools and children taking, as young as six, taking shooting classes with automatic weapons and so forth. And so um, internationally, Texas has become known as the epicenter of gun culture in America, much to my dismay, but that's just the way it is. So. The things that we do here in Texas are very important, even though we live in a deeply red state in terms of our state government, and, and um, the momentum continues to be with expanding gun rights. When we do things here to resist and to fight back, it's heard around the nation and around the world, uh, and it does 
affect people. And, and I'll give you some examples of that later today. But I did want to cover a little bit of what's happened since the last time we were here. And I think it's important to realize that, and, and I'm sure some of you know, we basically have just experienced one of the most violent summers for gun violence in the history of the United States. And when I say violent, it's not that the number of deaths were higher, but they were higher profile, um, and they led to social upheaval and protests and really what I call the evolution of this movement to prevent gun violence. And that's because um, we cannot escape it. It is seeping into every corner of our lives, every population, every part of the country. We cannot ex escape the gun violence. I, I'll, I'll start by adding that we, of course, have had the issue of police-involved shootings um, on African-American males and others. That continued throughout the spring and into the summer. Uh, but on June 12th, we had the most um, deadly mass shooting in the history of the United States at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, where a man affiliated loosely with ISIS um, and um, also motivated uh, by hate um, attacked this gay nightclub and killed 49 people and wounded 53 with an assault-style rapid-fire weapon. He overcame an armed security guard, trapped the folks inside, and hunted them down until police were finally able to break through and take him out. I was on the road with my family to Minnesota for a vacation in the middle of the wilderness at that time, and I, someone, I found out about it on Facebook. Someone had posted it, and I couldn't believe it. So we're in an area where we can't reach... Uh, the internet very well at all and I'm trying to keep up on what's happening and I'm trying to call people and and I'll never forget doing that and as I'm doing that the death toll keeps rising first it was 10 then it was 15 25 30 40 then was getting close to 50 I couldn't believe it unfortunately I'd been in that position before with the elementary school shooting at Newtown with Virginia Tech that's the way these things work there's always a report of one or more shooters usually it's just one Police come in, they go through what they have, and the death toll keeps rising, and it rises for several days afterward um, as the injured succumb to their wounds. So that was a very traumatic time for me personally, but also everyone involved in the gun violence prevention movement because we said it was going to happen. We said guns are so easy to obtain, terrorists will obtain them on our soil, and they will use them, which they had already done last year in San Bernardino, but nothing happened. It was just almost, okay, there was this terrible shooting. There was wall-to-wall -wall coverage for a while, and then it went back to normal. But actually, something did happen. I think it may not have had the visceral reaction that Newtown had on some people, but it woke people up to the fact that no population is safe from this, and that everywhere we go, every public place we go, this could happen. And it can happen in a place with an armed guard. It can happen in a nightclub when you're having a good time. It can happen in a school. It can happen in the store. It can happen in the shopping mall. And you would think, well, maybe people should have woken up to that long ago. But it took this incident to really motivate some people. What happened is um, the... LGBT community became very activated over this incident because it was a hate crime. And uh, tremendous resources, which had been used in the battle for marriage equality, have now turned towards this issue. Because it, it's not only just gun violence, but it's the issue of hate in our general society. Um, and at a very grassroots level, uh, groups began to form gays against gun violence for one. There is a group called One Pulse for America, which has a very popular Facebook page and website started by George Takai of Star Trek fame. Over, I believe, 10,000 people are on that site every day. Uh, we had a rush of people going to grassroots websites, Moms Demand Action, uh, for example, Every Town for Gun Safety, the Newtown Action Alliance. People said, hey, I'm sick of this and I want to see what's going on. And, and that's always a positive step. So this, in turn, motivated members of Congress because of the gridlock in Congress. Nothing has been done on this issue for many years. And you may have heard of the sit-in, which I believe Bonnie mentioned. Um, I was in Minnesota when that happened. 
and I did manage to hear about it, and it was tremendous. Um, what It was symbolic, yes. But for two days, basically, members of Congress sat down and said, no more, we're going to focus the nation's attention on the fact that nothing has been done. And so that made everyone, including the majority, go on the record and try to explain why they haven't done anything. Some of them explained it, some of them did not. But it really focused attention on the fact that Congress has done absolutely nothing on this. Um, so then that inspired grassroots activists to go further. And we had um, some great events take place later on in the summer, but unfortunately the violence continued. Um, you, I mentioned police-involved shootings earlier. In early July, we had the shootings, police-involved shootings of black men in Baton Rouge and in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, that were caught on camera. Um, very suspicious circumstances, which led to very large protest. This, in turn, unfortunately led to counter-protests that were outside the movement, that were not peaceful, and led to the sniper attack in Dallas on July 7th. Five police officers were killed. That is the most violent attack on police officers and deadly attack on police officers since 9-11. Ten days later, followed by another shooting of police officers in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Three officers were killed, others injured, and the shooter killed as well. That was a direct result of the Dallas shooting. So things began, it was just tumultuous at that point. And, and it was almost chaotic, if you remember what it was like at the summer. Like, what is going to happen next? What is going to happen next? And of course, things continue to happen. We had in September, the shooting at the Seattle area shopping mall, which has not received really the publicity it deserves uh, because of the political campaign dominating the media. But you had a 20-year-old man there with a shotgun go into a Macy's and just randomly start shooting people at the makeup counter. And he killed five, walked away from the scene, got away, and was eventually captured 24 hours later, we still don't know much about the motive to that crime. But the manhunt was going on. He was eventually located. It was a huge story on the West Coast, but national media really didn't cover it that much. And it led me to wonder, well, wait a minute, guys. This, are you becoming desensitized to this? The person's still on the loose. And why isn't that the lead story on the news? Eventually, uh, they did catch him, however. And we continue... Well, one thing I would like to mention, though, is that even though we have these mass events that make the news, that's not the true story of the depth of gun violence we're experiencing. It's hitting people on a very personal level every day in ways that you don't read about in the paper. Suicide. Uh, over 30,000 gun deaths a year in the United States. Two-thirds of those are gun-related suicide. Um, that is rarely ever reported, rarely ever talked about. I know in my neighborhood in southwest Austin, three people in the last year have committed suicide by gun, um, hardly ever mentioned. But that, that's happening. We're also having a staggering number of children, um, accidental shootings in the home, misfiring of guns at gun ranges and so forth and so on because the number of guns sold has just gone through the roof. So it's easier to access guns. They're everywhere. And, and my belief is we're beginning to see that's having just consequences in the general population. That hasn't been borne out by a study yet, but I certainly believe that it will. On that note, uh, Texas Gun Sense, we, of course, deal with policy in Texas relating to guns and lobbying the legislature and trying to open their minds to do something about this problem. And we talk a lot about policy, and we talk a lot about um, the NRA and the Texas State Rifle Association and the amount of money that the Attorney General took from this lobby and et cetera, et cetera. And that's a lot of inside baseball, though, when compared to the amount of violence that's going on in everyday life. So one of the things that I'd like to focus on today is instead of the big news events, the daily tragedies that are occurring to people's lives, 
I have been astounded lately. I have met so many people directly impacted by gun violence. And some of this came um, about with the 50th anniversary of the UT Tower shooting this summer. I met several of survivors of that attack, including Claire Wilson James, one of the first victims, who was seven months, eight months pregnant at the time. She lost her baby, but she survived. And other people who have lost children at Newtown and Santa Barbara City College shootings. And, and, and uh, it has moved me greatly and motivated me to continue on this. I would like to introduce to you a woman that I have the pleasure of knowing who is going to share her story. She is a survivor of gun violence. And I want you to take this as an example of what an everyday gun violence survivor story is. It happens every single day. I get notifications on the Internet when these things happen around the country, and you would not believe how common it is. If the victim doesn't die, you often don't hear about it on the news, or it's just a little blip. But when these folks survive... They deal with this tragedy for the rest of their lives. Everyone in their lives deals with that tragedy. Um, so I think without uh, much more introduction, because I really look forward to you hearing her story, um, uh, this, this woman is a, is a tremendous volunteer with Texas Gun Sense. She goes into the community and speaks to community groups to relate her story. So I'd like to introduce to you Susan Wilson. Hi, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Ed. <laughs> I, I don't deserve such praise, but thank you. Um, yes, I am a volunteer with Texas Gun Sense, and how I got involved was, um, like Ed said, I have a very personal story, and it's taken me a long time to, to um, be able to share that. Um, so 23 years ago, um, I guess this is why I got, I got so involved, is... It's been 23 years for me, and the same things are happening, only getting worse and worse and worse, and I keep thinking, when is this going to change? 23 years ago, I was involved in a home robbery where a homeowner, my friend, had a gun and who had a right to have that gun. Um, but unfortunately, just like today, people don't know really how to properly store their, their weapons at home. Um, and so children are finding them and um, accidents are happening. And in my case, um, a, an intruder found the gun and um, used the gun against myself and the person who owned the gun. And um, unfortunately, that my friend did not survive. We were both shot pretty much point blank in the back of the head trying to, to escape the home. Um, but uh, somehow, I, somehow I managed to live. Uh, I, a neighbor, thankfully upstairs, heard the gunshot and called 911. And um, I was life flighted to, this was in Arlington, Texas, I was life flighted to John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth. And um, each day I spent um, on life support in a coma, thinking, doctors thinking it would be my last day to live. Um, a good portion of my brain was gone. Um, and to this day, it's still gone, so I apologize if I am slow or if I stutter, because uh, I do have a bit of a, a, a learning process or a, a processing of um, my words. Uh, but people look at me and they say, oh, how could you have been shot? You, you don't have any scars. And, and unfortunately, we do. We remember the people that have died. And unless you've died and you, people that are surviving, like myself, um, we, we don't get recognized because, they, oh, it couldn't be that bad because you're still alive. But I deal, like God said, day to day um, with struggles on um, the memory of, of what happened. Um, I spent two weeks in a coma, so yeah, there's a big chunk that I don't remember. Um, but I do remember waking up and realizing that I was 29 years old and I couldn't walk and I could barely see. My vision was very blurry. I couldn't hardly speak. Um, I couldn't read and write. I, 
I couldn't um, take care of myself anymore. I was pretty much an infant again in a full-size grown-up body. And that would be something that I would have to relearn. Um, thankfully, I had a lot of help along the way. I, had, um, I was admitted into a re rehab facility in San Angelo, um, uh, spent three months there, and was transferred to another rehab facility in Dallas and spent an additional three months there. And, um, and I was fortunate. Um, most people don't get that. It's, um, it's sad that um, so little is known about survivors. Um, and um, I go to a, uh, I go to a uh, brain injury support group still 23 years later, and I, and I visit with people and share my story and listen to their stories of how they're still struggling after 23 years or five years or two years. Um, gun violence takes a, a toll on everyone. It wasn't just myself. It was my family. Uh, my family now had um, a, a sibling or a daughter that had been self-sufficient, self-reliant, had been on her own for 29 years and was now pretty much an invalid and having to start start over and having to care for them. And the financial impact of that was, uh, was massive um, on not just my family, but our whole, our whole system uh, as a government. I mean, they couldn't, my family couldn't afford all of my rehab that I needed or my hospital bills. Um, I certainly couldn't. And a lot of that fell on the community, and it, it impacts everyone's lives. Everyone that I've that I've met in my life before, or after the shooting, have been impacted by this. Because the people that knew me before the shooting, I'm not that person anymore. I'm a totally different person. I started my life over, and so they've had to adjust. It's affected them, knowingly or unknowingly. It, they've been impacted. Um, our financial system uh, of our government. I've, I've had to draw money from our government for rehab. Um, thankfully, we had um, access to a, a, a very um, strong community support um, that my sister had in San Angelo um, that, that, that helped support that um, and get me into a rehab facility there. And then at the time, uh, the state was able to step in and help with some. But again, then I had still had this huge bill that I kept getting bills and bills. And it's, it's, it's massive. Um, so the, the impact is, um, it's not just on me learning how to read and write and walk and talk and start my life over or someone at any age, but it's, um, the the emotional draw and the financial draw and there's just so much it, it impacts it's um it just keeps going on and on um, after getting out of rehab I was uh, I was released to the community I felt like I was a convict being set out on you're free to go <laughs> to, into the world and um and I kind of got a sense of what that that might feel like if someone had been incarcerated for a long time, um, where do I start? What do I do? How do I find a job? Um, how do I support myself? It was, um, it was all foreign. I, I relearned all of this. Um, I didn't do it well in a lot of ways. Um, I struggled with depression. Um, I, I didn't admit that for a long time. That was really hard for me. Um, to admit that I needed help, that I still needed some help, that I wasn't, that this was not something that I could just shake off and get over, that this was going to be a part of my life, and that I would need to continue um, therapy and counseling probably for the rest of my life. I still, um, I, I still work on that, and I still see therapists, and I still communicate, and I reach out, and I, um, I speak out about it, and I think Texas Gun Sense has been a kind of a form of therapy for me that I can get out and I can share with people that this impacts all of us. It's not just me. It's not just my family. It's not just um, 
the people in the news, oh, well, that happened in Orlando, so, you know, I live in Texas, that doesn't really affect me. It does. It affects everyone in more ways than you can imagine if you start breaking it down and looking at what it takes to have someone recover from this, um, whether they were shot in the back of the head like I was or whether it was um, just being held at gunpoint and looking at someone in the eyes with someone pointing a gun at you, telling, telling you they're going to take your life. Um, if you make the wrong move, that's a, a devastating. Um, you don't even have to be shot um, to have the impact be uh, so great. So um, I don't want to go on too much about my story. Um, I, I don't want to bore you all, but um, I, I just want you to know that um, it is ongoing after 23 years we do need to make some changes and we need people to speak out and we need people to speak up and get involved and um, get involved with organizations like Texas Gun Sense and um, there's so many out there which is great but it's sad that we need them. Um, I'm really hoping to someday put them out of business and we won't need those anymore and people will have uh, some common sense gun laws and um, be a little more responsible. Um, but uh, is there anything else you want me to share right now? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And, and guys, when we're done, I, I would encourage you to ask Susan questions uh, if you have them also more about her story. Uh, because, sure, it's a personal story, but I think we understand these things on a personal level and it makes a difference. And one of the, the reasons that I think this summer motivated me to somewhat change the way that I address this issue is because we have such gridlock politically on the issue because of special interests and various other things. The only way I found to break through that is to talk to people realistically about what is happening because we can wall ourselves off, we can be friends with just our like-minded friends on Facebook, we can tune out what we don't want to hear. But when we're faced with some of these things, it makes an impact. And I, I think going back to this theme of personal stories, I made a vow after this uh, mall shooting in Seattle that every time I speak on this issue, I'm going to mention five people who were lost to gun violence in the previous week or two weeks. And it really illustrates the depth of this problem. If you'll indulge me, I want to go through that very quickly uh, because it is a wide range of people all across the country. You may have seen in the news the case of six-year-old Jacob Hall, a kindergarten student at Townville Elementary School in Townville, South Carolina. He was among three people shot when a mentally disturbed 14-year-old murdered his father with a gun given to him by his mother as a present. The shooter then walked to the nearby elementary school where he opened fire as students were released for recess. Jacob was shot in the leg but lapsed into a coma due to severe blood loss. His parents eventually made the decision to take him off life support. His mother said that Jacob was the perfect son, was a big fan of superheroes, and his favorite story he would tell her at night when the family was sleeping that he was out on the town catching bad guys. Jose Alvarez, a 16-year-old high school sophomore from Fort Worth, died September 29th. He and friends were sitting in a car playing with a gun that had been given to them by an adult. They were passing the gun around, not aware that it was loaded. One of the students pulled the trigger, shooting and killing Jose instantly. Uh, police um, Later found out who provided the gun. He was outside the car a short uh, distance away. It was not under his supervision. Uh, this man has been charged with the strictest crime, uh, able to charge him in the state of Texas, uh, which is providing a, making a gun accessible to a minor that resulted in death. That penalty is a class A misdemeanor published, um, punishable by a $4,000 fine. Just yesterday in Palm Springs, California, a um, 
Mother called police with a domestic disturbance call. Her adult son was causing a disturbance in the home and she could not get him to leave. It turns out he was mentally disturbed. Officers responded and a gunfire broke out. Killed were two officers, Jose Gilbert Vega, a 35-year veteran of the police force, 63 years old with eight children. He was due to retire in December, but he insisted on still driving a patrol car and working two overtime shifts a week, including the one he was on yesterday when he was shot. Leslie Zarab Zarabini, 27-year-old, member of the force just a little over one year. She had just returned from maternity leave. She leaves behind her husband and four-month-old daughter. Apparently, the police responded to the scene. They could not get the suspect to leave the house. A burst of gunfire that witnesses report as more than 30 gunshots in just a few seconds rang out, killing the officers. And this is a case that really struck me. Benjamin Smith, age two, from Milford County Township, Pennsylvania, on September 12th. He and his dad were watching cartoons, uh, Winnie the Pooh, actually. He took a break, said he wanted to go watch it himself in his room. And minutes later, the dad found, um, heard a loud gunshot ring out from the bedroom. Turns out uh, that Benjamin, instead of going to his own room, walked into his dad room, dad's room and pulled out a Smith & Wesson MP45 caliber handgun, left loaded and unsecured in the nightstand. He pulled the trigger, killing himself. Uh, family describes Benjamin as a happy two-year-old who loved kicking cans in the backyard and playing with his extensive collection of toy guns. According to his great-grandfather, some were water guns, some were styrofoam guns, but a lot of them looked real. The mother provided police with a photograph showing the boy holding the to a toy pistol with a two-handed professional grip. Uh, another shows the boy in his dad's room within arm's reach of an open box of ammunition and camouflage military-style gear. It should be noted in this case that the father has been arraigned, charged with manslaughter and reckless endangerment of a child. Why I want to mention that, these types of prosecutions are very rare. They are almost unheard of. We have these cases happen in Texas over and over again. Very rarely are the parents charged. I was trying to find a case in the past six months where a parent has been charged in Texas and I can't find one. Usually it's a terrible accident. The cost of losing a child is um, considered punishment enough. But when we're looking at a real basic way to attack this problem, we've got all this political intransience and people won't listen to one another and pass common sense laws. How about let's just pass along the common sense to one another? This case, this father had this weapon in the nightstand loaded. He had guns all around the house. The, the son played with guns. He didn't know the difference between a toy gun and a real But I have personally had many gun rights activists in Texas explain to me why they keep loaded weapons in their nightstand or under their pillow or under their mattress at night loaded, even though they have kids in the house because they have to be able to protect themselves from an intruder or from whether, what other threat they believe they face. And that they believe that's their constitutional right to do that. And that the, the government has no right to come in and tell them they can't do that and enforce a penalty for just trying to protect themselves and their family. But the evidence is very, very clear. And I was saying I hear about these cases constantly. I almost every day see a notification of a child dying because of something like this. Maybe a, a brother gets a hold of the weapon, accidentally shoots the toddler brother, um, accidentally shoots his mom, etc. It is happening. We have no official mechanism to track that, but believe me, it is happening. So I know this is being shown on Access Television and this is going to be um, run on Co-op Radio. If anyone out there is listening, I would beg you, to think about if you have a gun at home, where is it right now? Is it loaded? If someone broke into your home right now, could they find that gun and take it? Do you have children at home? Could they find that gun and take it? Doesn't matter if you've taught your children how to shoot or how to care for a gun. Could they access it? Could a friend come in the house? Could a neighbor come in the house, find that gun and access it?
This is very basic stuff, folks. Lock up your guns in your house or put a gun lock on the gun that only you have the quick three-number combination to. So you can access it if you want, but it just can't be picked up and fired. This is common sense. If you have children and they're going to a neighbor's house and you're going to call the mom and you're going to say, well, Susie needs to be back at 5 p.m., she has an allergy to peanuts, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, do you have guns in the house? And if you do, are they stored properly? Uh, that is a basic question. If they get offended, that may be a problem. Um, you may not want your child going over there any longer. I'll leave that up to you. But it's very, very basic safety. I had a case, a very good friend of mine. Her daughter is um, same age as my daughter, um, third grade and uh, has seen things on the news and was talking to her mom about guns. Mom, why don't we have a gun? I think it would be fun. And she's saying, no, I, if you ever go anywhere and you see a gun, I want you to run away, I want you to find an adult, and I want you to tell them. She proceeded to tell her mom, well, her best friend across the park in our little neighborhood where we live, um, that they've been talking about this, and they searched her friend's home for a gun, and they couldn't find one over there. So don't think that kids aren't thinking about this type of thing. They are thinking about this type of thing. This is probably the most preventable type of gun death out there. It's just common sense safety. And, and I could criticize the people that are doing this, and I could call them paranoid and et cetera because they have loaded guns out. I don't even think that that's really appropriate because they can still protect themselves with just a very few safety measures. And how people become aware of this is when we care enough to start talking about it, when we care enough to start sharing these stories, and, and, and it just has to be part of everyday conversation, for example. Do you have guns in the house, and are they properly stored? Are they locked, kept away from children? If anyone hearing this or here today does that with people, imagine the ripple effect that has across society. It gets people thinking of not only that issue, but about gun safety in general. And it doesn't involve one law. It doesn't involve our legislators actually listening to people and doing something. It involves our personal daily contact with our family and our neighbors. So that's, that's one way that we can make a difference. I do want to state that Texas Gun Sense, of course, we are a nonprofit organization which was started around um, the campus carry debate at UT a few years ago and has since grown. We are the organization that deals with Texas gun issues, um, and we are almost completely funded within Texas by Texans, and that makes a difference, especially with legislators who tend to believe that this type of thinking only comes from other states or outside forces. And the number of people being involved continues to grow. You're not the only one. We have more people here this time than we had last time I was here. And after what happened this summer, believe me, there are more people that care about this issue. Um, I urge you to go to our website, txgunsense.org. Txgunsense also look up our Facebook page and like that and join it. Um, we not only, we lobby the legislature and we ask for volunteers to come and speak and share their stories, uh, but we also have events. We had our annual fundraiser, which was last week, which is um, part of the Concert Across America to End Gun Violence, and more than 300 performances across the country um, with a variety of grassroots organizations had concerts where people attended. Some of them were fundraisers, some of them were not in New York City. They had a big concert with Jackson Brown and Eddie Vedder and several others, Roseanne Cash. We had concerts in Los Angeles. Thousands of people showed up. I believe the estimation was 20,000 musicians, if I'm correct, participated in this. So musicians and artists are also being involved in this as well. And, and I just want people to remember, it's not just about politics. It's not just about so-and-so won't vote for background checks because they got paid off by the NRA. Yes, it's partly that. But it's also our public consciousness, our commitment to a peaceful life and the safety of our children and our loved ones. So there are many things that we can do that don't necessarily involve politics. So I hope that you'll check out... Um, texasgunsense.org, and um, we can begin working together. We do have a legislative um, agenda for next session. I will quickly mention 
that on the political side, the battle is not over. We expect, and some of this depends on how the November election turns out, but we expect there to be a retrenching in favor of more gun access in Texas. We expect there to be a move to try to lower the age to carry guns from 21 to 18, which would make them available, widely available on college campuses because most college students would be able to carry. There's even talk of a bill that would allow open carry of weapons on college campuses, which you may think is absurd, but it's out there. Uh, there are attempts to um, further strengthen the campus carry law so you couldn't restrict guns from anywhere at a college campus. They would be allowed anywhere, professors' offices, dorms, etc. cetera. There, are, there are, is a move in place to strengthen the open carry law, which would prohibit uh, business owners make it very difficult for them to restrict the carry of weapons in their private businesses. That's very controversial, but some states have passed that. But the biggest one, I think the one I fear the most, is an effort, they call it constitutional carry, but it's actually permitless carry, where anyone can buy a gun and carry that gun anywhere they want, open or concealed, without a license, and technically without a background check. This is a law that's been passed in Kansas. This is a law that was passed in Missouri two weeks ago where they overrode overwhelmingly the governor's veto to install this law. Um, we've yet to see, these laws are so new, we haven't yet to see the impact of them. Uh, but that, to me, in Texas would be a disaster. And we need people to mobilize to fight that one. I know that state police associations are very much opposed to that, but in the past that hasn't necessarily made a difference. But that's one on defense that we need, really need to pay attention to. Um, but one thing that's different is because of organizations like ours, we're also playing a little offense. We're appealing to some of their basic nature, and we're trying to get good things, good safety measures passed. Common sense that don't restrict rights, but all they have to do is pay attention. And one of those things would be possibly on um, securing your weapons at home, but a very important bill, some states call it a gun violence prevention order, where an abused spouse, um, or, or for an example, a, a family going through a divorce, or you have a spouse or someone in the family with violent tendencies or mental um, disorder that is making violent threats, Right now under the law, you can't do anything really until they actually break the law and hurt someone. But in California, they've passed a law where you can go to a court and you can ask for a specific order and a hearing before a judge where the judge can prohibit that person from buying or possessing firearms until they are declared competent to have them. And we think in many, many mass shooting cases, for example, or um, murder suicides of families, there was plenty of warning, there were plenty of threats made, but nothing could be done until it was too late. So in Washington state, this is initiative that's on the ballot, which is likely going to pass as well, that's gonna be going across the country and stiff resistance here in Texas, but I think it's very common sense bill. Um, very, very easy things, like until a few months ago, the Department of Public Safety on their gun license page did not have the word safety on that page. It wasn't even mentioned. They've since changed that. We are working with them to establish a gun safety program and storage program as part of their budget and part of the materials that they give to people when they get a license to carry. You'd think that would be easy to get through, but it was not. So... We're going to continue to follow on that. These little incremental steps we think will make a difference, and we hope that you'll join us. And I think we're ready for some questions. Statistically, I've seen correlations that the more guns you have per population in a state, uh, the more shootings there are per population in a state. Have you uh, compiled evidence along those lines, and is this something GunSense presents to the public? There is, um, there is evidence that the more guns uh, owned in certain states, that the rate of gun, uh, the gun death is higher. The issue is many of those studies are older studies. As you know, Congress passed a law 
several years ago that prohibits the um, Centers for Disease Control and the federal government from um, studying these things. So there have been some private studies, some university studies, a Harvard study recently that did show that, again, we talked about early, increased access to guns is going to statistically lead to a higher rate of gun death. Now, keep in mind that could also be suicide. It doesn't necessarily have to be a violent crime. It can be a suicide or some kind of accident, uh, but also there's also firm evidence that in terms of spousal abuse and um, uh, the protection of women, that um, the line that the NRA will sell women especially, and if you watch the OU Texas game, you saw this uh, commercial on endlessly yesterday about I'm a female and I have a gun to protect myself. Well, the statistics actually show that women that own guns, their chance of being killed by a gun in the home is twice that of, of a non-gun owner. And again, it's just access and the availability of weapons. These are dangerous things. I hear gun activists say, well, a gun is a tool. A tool never killed anyone. Well, yeah, well, that's a pretty dangerous tool and it's designed to kill someone. So that's what we're dealing with here. It's not a hammer. It's, it's something much more dangerous than that. And it's powerful. So we're dealing with something very powerful um, in the home. Now, Susan, she, her situation, there was a gun in the home, and it was unsecured. So do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I think the, the big problems and the things that we face are I'm a native Texan. I am not an anti-gun person. My brothers own guns. I have family members that own guns. Um, Texas Gun Sense and the different organizations that are trying to get laws passed are common sense laws that will better educate. No one's trying to take guns away. Just as if my friend who owned that gun, had he been properly educated and know how to store his gun properly, then the person who shot us would not have had access to it. I don't blame my friend. He paid the ultimate price. He lost his life. Um, I basically lost mine. I got to start it over. But we need to educate people on what guns do and how to properly store them and just pass some better educated common sense laws, not, not take anyone's rights away and not say, you know, the guns are bad, but, but they are, yes, they are a tool. They're a tool to harm. <laughs> yes, yeah, so and then that's where the other side will try to trick their supporters into believing that we want to take guns away. No, it's, it, it's a right, but with a right comes responsibility, and there's a big lack of responsibility out there, and especially on this issue of, of uh, controlling access to weapons within the home. And then just also just basic knowledge. These stats we talked about saying that a woman is twice as likely to die uh, from a gun if a gun is in the home. That's not saying, hey, don't have a gun in the home. That's just saying pay attention if you have a gun in the home and, and be safe with it. That, most of this happens because they're not keeping it stored correctly or because it's out too much or sometimes um, there's a violent confrontation and someone grabs a gun. It's a very impulsive thing. But we could prevent some of that if we had these gun violence protective orders because, again, almost always it's not a big surprise when it happens because that person's made threats, they had a violent past, they had a bad temper, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it's not trying to shame people because they like to hunt or because maybe they live in an area where they think they need a gun for protection, and that is the case in, in some neighborhoods and some places, definitely. It, it's, it's just trying to wake people up and pay attention. And that's, that's probably the most effective thing we can do is wake people up and have them pay attention. Peter Durkin, and, and I was wondering, given this uh, political gridlock that we're in, wouldn't we better be served to focus on gun safety and quit trying to get the, our legislatures to do things that they won't do? Well, and, and it, I think that's part of what, when I talk about this movement evolving, some of that is happening 
in the sense of we need to keep the push on, I think, for things like background checks, universal background checks, which 90% of the American public supports. No one wants, uh, you know, the, the saying is a good guy with a gun is the only one that can stop a bad guy with a gun. Well, how about let's just keep the bad guy from having a gun uh, because they've already given up their right to their previous behavior. But background checks, um, I personally, limits on, on assault weapon magazines, things of this nature, hollow point bullets, things of that. But we're not talking about taking the guns away. We have to continue to have that debate. But in the meantime, I was dealing this summer with a big sense of power, powerlessness after Orlando and hopelessness, like I've been doing all this and what nothing's happening. What it is happening and it can happen when we focus on these basic steps of gun safety and making people aware. Because I believe that truth is going to win the day. And over time, you may have people believe otherwise that you're trying to trick them or whatever. But eventually, it's going to affect someone in their family, someone that they know, someone on their block. And their eyes are going to be opened. And I had very interesting, and it really stuck with me, Claire Wilson, James, I mentioned. Um, but also... Um, a set of parents whose daughter died in the um, Aurora, Colorado theater shooting um, from an automatic weapon. <clears throat> and and her, her whole um, attitude towards this is people saying, why, why do you keep bringing this up? And you're trying to take people's guns away. And she says, no, I just want you to learn a lesson that I learned the hard way. I don't want you to learn that way. I'm here to tell my story. So you don't have to learn the way I did. She and her husband were NRA members, big conservative Republicans that own guns. And they never would have thought anything like this could happen to their daughter. And they just want people to wake up and pay attention. And once we get past that hurdle with more and more people, then I think the legislation will eventually come, and hopefully with some political change as well. They did. They, they were um, primarily a hunting safety um, and sporting organization. Then in the 60s, with an increase in gun violence and political assassinations, the laws started to tighten up, um, and they saw that as a threat. And in the mid-70s, there's a real famous um, tale of, I believe their national convention was in Cincinnati, and at that conference, uh, the... the um, Officers were overthrown by the membership, and they installed very far-right, very conservative uh, members running the organization to where their basically take is today that there be no compromise on any type of access to guns, period. They used to be in favor of background checks for everyone. They used to be opposed to guns in schools, but they basically have taken it. No compromise, because you give them an inch, they'll take a mile which to me indicates these are people that feel threatened, um, but in, they're threatened by common sense, really. Um, so, yeah, they did used to be a sporting organization. But, you know, I, I used to blame the NRA and say they're responsible for all this, but they're not because I think every individual has free will and they have the ability to learn. They just have to be open to doing it. Uh, there is a hashtag on Twitter, pound sign gun fail. And it's astonishing, and especially with the toddlers and such, either shooting themselves or their parents. And much of this activity is function, focused on the states. Is, uh, is there some possibility of really doing something at the federal level? Ultimately, that may be what needs to happen, because when you have 50 states making their own laws, it's a mishmash, and of course... Um, I like to use the example of Chicago because some gun rights folks will always bring up Chicago as a failure of gun regulation because there's more deaths and so and so. And until recently, you weren't supposed to be able to have a gun in Chicago and et cetera, et cetera. But Chicago is surrounded by states with some of the most least restrictive gun laws in the country. And there's a huge market to run weapons to our major cities from rural areas. And Texas is a big supplier of guns to the rest of the nation and to Mexico, for example, um, which has been a problem for years. Um, as far as transport and regulation of weapons over state lines, it is going to take federal action. Uh, I think that the, the folks that protested this summer and did the sit-in, I, I was hoping they'd come back from 
break and continue to do that. But we need more actions like that, I think, to, to get attention. There will have to be political change in Congress, I think, one day before we get federal regulations. But I think it will happen at some point. We only have a couple of minutes left, and so a short question and response. Uh, Jim Bryce. Uh, I know Claire Wilson. I was there that day. I, Sandra Wilson was coming to meet me for lunch, and she was shot. So right. I'm familiar. But my question is totally different. When I've traveled around over many years, I've had people in foreign countries say, they do not want to come to the United States for the guns, particularly the state of Texas. We also have situations in which people are not coming to our faculty and are leaving. The economic consequences of this obsession with guns uh, is an issue I would like to understand more about. Has there been research demonstrating the economic consequences of this widespread area of guns? Any research in that area has been very limited because it would take a lot of resources. And, of course, as I mentioned, we can't have a federal study on that. The state refuses to do any study like that. That would go about nowhere with the Department of Public Safety who would do a study like that. But it would be interesting. I would like business groups to um, study this, for example. And that's one danger, I think, one way that we may be able to stop permitless carry in the state of Texas, it worked in Oklahoma and some other states, is all the major business groups got together, the sports teams got together, um, leaders within communities, mayors, everyone got together with a statement and said, do not pass this because it will destroy the state economically. Uh, in Texas, if you had something, an effort like that, if you had uh, the business associations, the apartment associations, the retailers associations, even oil and gas companies, uh, the Dallas Cowboys even, everyone come together and make this statement right at the top and say, look, you're going to kill business if you pass this law. That may be one way that you can reach some people into thinking twice before they do this. But I think... You know, all bets are off. Anything can happen because that, that will to further um, enhance gun rights in the legislature is very, very deep because it's very gerrymandered districts, and that is one of the top issues that they run on in their primaries. They don't want to be primaried if they are seen as being anti-gun. So that's something we definitely have to keep an eye on. Ed and Susan, thank you so very much for your presentation today. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you for your great work. Thank you so much. Thank you.